prospects of the BRI for promoting trade and promoting connectivity. Uh, it's been very enriching and very interesting. I'm sure those of you uh, who have been with us for those sessions would agree with, uh, with that. Uh, one thing we have not explored so much is the view from policy, the view of policy makers, uh, the view from policy practitioners, both in China as well as in uh, the BRI recipient countries. And this is what this session uh, aspires to do. Uh, we will have three policy dialogues with uh, policy practitioners uh, and, and policy observers and commentators. Uh, so it's, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker of, on, on, on the policy dialogue, and he's uh, uh, Liu Chin Tong, uh, a form, the former Deputy Defence Minister uh, of Malaysia. Uh, he's a good friend as well. Uh, uh, Chin Tong is, uh, also sits in the Malaysian Senate. He's a member of the, his party's Central Executive Committee and serves as the National Political Education Director. He's currently chairman of research for, he's chairman of the research for social advancement think tank, which uh, he's been uh, serving since uh, 2012. So Chinto is going to speak to us about uh, the, the, the BRI in Maritime Southeast Asia. And the title of his talk is Neither Threat Nor, uh, Neither Threat Nor Success. So uh, uh, ambiguous, uh, but nonetheless intriguing uh, title. So over to you, Chinto. Uh, please feel free to share your screen uh, if you have your slides. Hi, uh, Donald and um, uh, distinguished fellows and friends who are attending this session. Uh, I will try to speak in, within about, say, 15 minutes, and uh, then we open up for more discussions and dialogue. Uh, I give a title, neither a threat nor a success, because I think uh, sometimes some of these uh, discussions are overrated, and often uh, uh, some of the discussions are overrated on either end, either, either we think that uh, BI is a major threat if you follow uh, Western uh, discussions. But on another hand, uh, if you follow China's uh, discussion, uh, it seems like it was a great success. But I don't think uh, any of those are true. Now, I confine it to maritime Southeast Asia, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, the Philippines, and uh, Singapore. And the reason why I, I group this together, these countries together, is because I think these are the most important country to, to at least the maritime part of BRI. Uh, there are two parts of uh, BRI. I, I, the most important puzzle is actually the maritime Southeast Asia. Uh, because, uh, say, continental Southeast Asia is very much influenced by China with or without BRI. Uh, its proximity and also its uh, uh, closeness to China in terms of uh, policy alignment, with or without BRI, that has already happened. But Maritime Southeast Asia should have been the number one concern for China. But unfortunately, I think over the last seven or eight years, uh, China has not been able to put this as the number one uh, area which it will handle with care and handle with tech. Uh, I think they, they are missed opportunity. Uh, and this is where, uh, at the end of my talk, I thought um, China, should have, uh, uh, re chi China should rethink and actually uh, come up with some new, new approaches to this region. This region is also important geographically and, and particularly on uh, jaw strategy. It's a long major waterway and it is not necessarily too uh, hostile to China, but at the same time, it is a contested area on both sides. And these smaller states do have anxiety and they, they are concern about the way China is approaching the region. And I think China needs to really think through how it deals with the region. These states, the Maritime Southeast Asian states, do not want to see 
these areas as a theater for big power competition. And the smaller powers in the region do have agency. And often China is viewing this region as just as big uh, <clears throat> a theater for China-US competition without actually understanding the agency of these respective states. And I think that is very important for China to understand that each of these states has their own agency. And more importantly, each of these states has domestic audience. The domestic audience within these areas, uh, the domestic audience within these countries are very important and they, they need to be dealt with in a way, in a tactful way. I give an example. Within the domestic political spectrum of the Philippines, it is very difficult to find someone like Duterte. Someone like President Duterte is rare in the political spectrum in the Philippines. But I think China somehow has missed the opportunity in, in reassuring the Filipino public, the Filipino public, so that President Duterte do not have to worry about his domestic backyard. But with the whole debate about South China Sea, it is unnecessarily have, it is not, not very helpful to, to the cause of uh, President Duterte. And therefore, it makes it difficult for China to gain an upper hand when, when it comes to engaging and uh, uh, reaching out to Southeast Asian states. Now, in the Defense White Paper of 2019 in Malaysia, we see we are trying to redefine the way Malaysia sees the region as well. Uh, we see Malaysia as a nation, a maritime nation with continental roots. And we say that Malaysia, located at the center of Southeast Asia, is a maritime country flanked by South China Sea and Pacific Ocean on one side, and the Straits of Malacca and Indian Oceans on the other. Malaysia is also a nation with continental routes connected to mainland Southeast Asia and Europe Asia by land. This unique location allows Malaysia to assume a crucial role of connecting both the Asia Pacific and Indian Ocean regions for shared prosperity. And during this time of uncertainty, it is imperative that we take serious effort to protect our national interests and defend our sovereignty as well as territorial integrity. You can see in this statement that the, the Malaysian state doesn't want to be caught in the whole debate about Indo-Pacific. Or actually, in general, ASEAN states do not want to endorse the US Indo-Pacific strategy. But at the same time, if you see in the last paragraph, there are concerns about China's behavior in the region, particularly uh, South China Sea. So I think these are concerns of states in South, Southeast Asia, and uh, there's a need for China to understand that each of these states has agency. It is not necessarily Cold War. Cold War, uh, was, Cold War happened or started when these states were not independent states. But today, these states has election. This state has a domestic audience, and they need to be taken care of. Now, in the, in the entire uh, period of uh, BRI since 2013, I think in, in these maritime states, they realize that, uh, they realize that no other actors offer similar development opportunity and benefits than China in terms of scale, in terms of magnitude. Therefore, they were hoping for BRI to transform uh, their economy. But unfortunately, from my point of view, BRI is heavily weighted towards construction-driven mega projects. Much as they were concerned, there were attempts to deal with uh, the, these perceptions, there were concerns to deal with sustainability, there were concerns to deal with uh, changing the perception and changing the focus in the multiple 
uh, deep, uh, big conferences in Beijing. But the point is, if you strip everything away and look at the projects that they, they, they were built under BRI, many of them are still construction-driven mega projects. Not enough has been done through winning hearts and minds. In the construction sector, China will have to deal with significant presence of Japanese construction companies in maritime Southeast Asia, and to a lesser extent, Korean companies. Of course, there are also other competitions uh, from Japan, the United States, and European Union. I think it's time that China has to rethink BRI, recognizing the importance of maritime Southeast Asia. Maritime Southeast Asia should be the number one concern for BRI. And over the last seven years, a lot has been done, yet not a lot of hearts and minds won for China. Uh, and this is where I think China has to rethink its approaches to understand that states have agencies, states have domestic audience, stakeholders, and think through how China should deal with the anxieties of small states in maritime Southeast Asia, especially with regard to South China Sea. Uh, with that, I thank you and uh, I welcome questions. Well, thanks very much, uh, Chin Tong, for, for, for kicking us off and for that uh, wide ranging and very thoughtful uh, presentation. Maybe I can start by uh, asking you about the role of ASEAN. Most of these BRI projects are done on a bilateral basis, uh, you know, G to G, sometimes even B to B, right, or, or B to G. Um, and you, you spoke about how Maritime Southeast Asia may, should be viewed separately or differently from continental Southeast Asia. Uh, but that is precisely the problem with ASEAN, right, uh, that parts of ASEAN, uh, particularly in continental Southeast Asia, are seen already as aligned with, with China. Although I should highlight that Vietnam and Myanmar see themselves very much as independent. So even within continental Southeast Asia, the story is not yeah. a uniform one. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a role for ASEAN to try to forge a more coherent uh, relationship with, in, with respect to BRI? Uh, should we be pushing for the centrality of ASEAN? Uh, in, in, in the BRI, uh, in, in making decisions on the BRI, just as we have been trying to push for the centrality of ASEAN in, or over the South China Sea, for instance. And talking about the South China Sea, of course, uh, you know, China's claims about shared, shared prosperity and peace does it sits oddly, sits very awkwardly, very uncomfortably with its territorial claims in the South China Sea. I think that's been a long-standing uh, concern of maritime Southeast Asian states. Uh, so, so, yeah, so a broad question on... on do you think there's a role that ASEAN can play here? And, and how, should, how should we uh, you know, pursue this agenda, considering that different country states have also have different interests? I mean, ASEAN is also quite, not quite a uniform entity, right? Uh, Donald, very interesting questions. I think uh, increasingly, I find that ASEAN is converging on one, uh, found, what they call one key message. That is, ASEAN states do not want to choose between the two big powers. If you read uh, Li Shenlong's piece in Foreign Affairs recently, it was very clear that he articulated this, uh, articulated this view that China doesn't want, uh, Southeast Asian states or ASEAN do not want to choose between China and uh, United States. It is interesting to watch how Singapore has moved from uh, Li Shenlong's visits to the White House in 2016 to this relatively middle path position. At the same time, it's interesting to watch the domestic audience in Cambodia not being happy with uh, BRI projects mm -hmm. and therefore also putting some pressure on the Cambodian states when it comes to relation, its relationship with China. The same goes to the Philippines. 
and uh, other states. So it's interesting to see that I think at some point, this convergence may happen. And this convergence is already happening. Uh, of course, I would like to think that uh, Li Xianlong's position is close now closer to Malaysia's long-held position than uh, Singapore's previous position. Malaysia's long-held position is that it doesn't want to choose between the two great power, and it thinks that Malaysia thinks that uh, it has its own agency. It, it is uh, ASEAN shouldn't be a theater, or South China Sea shouldn't be a theater of war. Uh, for, for the great powers. Mm -hmm. So ASEAN centrality often has to, has to present itself in a compromised middle ground position. For instance, uh, instead of saying no to Indo-Pacific, ASEAN say we have an outlook on, on the Indo-Pacific strategy. We are non-committal. I think that non-committal position is shared by most states in ASEAN uh, at different degree. So, so to answer your questions, I think uh, the, the common position is we do not want to choose between the two. We, and we also recognize that China will be there for the next 500 years geographically. And therefore, uh, in terms of geopolitics, uh, ASEAN states will still have to engage China. And we would like to see China as a positive force in the region. And this is where I think China uh, should recalibrate its approaches to Southeast Asia, particularly to maritime Southeast Asia in, in the years to come. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, 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 thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Chun Chong. Uh, I, I, there are a few questions on the Q&A, so maybe I'll, I'll combine them uh, and, 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 and post them to you. Uh, I mean, you, you spoke about winning hearts and minds also. Uh, how, how in specific terms should that be done? How should China effectively address anxiety uh, amongst these uh, domestic populations, domestic constituents, particularly in the smaller cities? And it's very interesting you mentioned even in Cambodia, and we all know of the, uh, the, the, the disaster that's been uh, the BRI in, in Sihanoukville. Uh, so how, how, how do you, how, in practical terms, how should China go about winning hearts and minds? Uh, also, um, We've seen many attempts, another question, we've seen many attempts on China's side to bridge perception gaps through people-to-people -people exchanges. And of course, BRI is partly also about people and people exchanges. Obviously, it's not done in a way or to the extent that uh, probably you would like to see. So what substantive steps do you think uh, China can take to connect hearts and minds that would distinguish it from other construction-oriented players uh, in, in, in maritime services. So talking about construction also, are there other areas you think China should shift the emphasis of BRI to, if not construction? Yeah, I think uh, ultimately, to economic development has to be shared on the ground. And one of the best ways to share economic prosperity or economic uh, uh, benefits is through jobs or job creation. Now, many people have, uh, have not talked about American investment in the region, but American investment in the region is huge. And uh, there are many jobs created that, has continued, that are continued uh, to continue to provide jobs for the countries in the region. It is important that investment of whatever sort eventually has to create jobs for the locals. So part of the problem with China's uh, construction-driven mega projects were that they were big. Uh, Scale-wise, it is not easy for locals to absorb, and it's not easy for locals to actually uh, consume. And it required consumers from China to buy the properties that were developed in this region, for instance. And because of the speed and scale and the, uh, the capabilities of uh, Chinese construction companies. It, it, very difficult for local con contractors, local workers, to be able to serve this project within the limited time frame that the Chinese construction company could achieve. And therefore, workers were brought in from China, and that also displaced local workers and locals con local contractors. 
So I think when it comes to investment, uh, sustainability is important, jobs is important, uh, sharing prosperity, sharing op economic opportunities with the locals will have to be the number one concern for any future development. Mm. And, and would you say that you know, this ability to create jobs is probably going to be greater uh, and, and, and the spillover benefits of development are going to be greater in non-construction related uh, yeah. endeavors. So for instance, manufacturing and, uh, and so on, right? Yeah, so I agree. With you. I, think, I think manufacturing, particularly manufacturing, uh, has been uh, uh, an area in which jobs could be created. Uh, over over a longer period of time, and skill development uh, happen, uh, trainings happen, uh, so so those has to be taken into consideration, so that it is not just uh, Chinese finances and Chinese mega construction companies coming into or property companies coming into a, a, a state, coming into a country, and displacing existing equations in the society. Okay, uh, Barry, you have a uh, Barry Saltman has a has a question for Chin Tong, a broader, more, almost conceptual question. Barry, go ahead. I'd like to ask about what you consider to be the criteria for determining whether or not uh, there's been success on the part of um, the BRI in maritime Southeast Asia. Uh, of course. Each person who um, makes a decision about whether something has been successful or a failure or somewhere in between has to have some criteria attached to that. I have a friend, for example, who produced a paper about China's uh, activities with regard to COVID-19 uh, and produced that paper in February. And the paper was about why China failed to deal with COVID-19. Uh, so, of course, that person had a set of criteria at that time and applied those uh, criteria, uh, but maybe if he were doing the paper today would have uh, a different set of criteria. And the same thing uh, goes to the second part of my question, which is, what's the time frame that we should use in determining whether or not uh, the BRI has been successful in maritime Southeast Asia or not? Uh, uh, very good questions. Uh, thank you, Barry. I would just like to approach your questions uh, with two uh, measurements. One is to, to uh, set against the aspiration uh, since 2013. Since uh, it was launched, the aspirations, uh, the, 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 the hope that uh, it could actually be a major game changer in the region. I think by now, uh, many people would have questions whether it was a major game changer. Uh, and, and I think that would be one of my criteria to, to consider these questions. The second part would be uh, if we have to go back to measurements of projects, uh, if we have to go back to quantity, uh, some of these projects that were implemented are, I mean, they are projects uh, that has been promoted, but it's still stuck politically as well as at Im implementation stage. And the number of successful projects under BRI uh, is not as many as uh, it was hoped. So i give you an example, uh, the ECRL, uh, Railway in Malaysia. This project has been very linked to the previous Prime, Prime Minister, Najib Razak, and under the Pakatan Harapan government, it was renegotiated. It took a while to renegotiate. It was realigned from, from uh, what they call a, a, a route that goes through the central range to one that goes through the south, which is so much cheaper. But now with another government coming in, in, fact, in March this year, uh, the new government intends to realign the road as well. Uh, therefore, for instance, this is one of the many projects that has already supposedly been constructed, but is still at the stage of uh, changes due to the political factors 
domestically, as well as I think from the design stage, it has not been uh, thought through. At least I would say that the domestic political factor has not been factored through well uh, since day one. So I think these are my criteria that I think there are many good projects, there are many successful projects. Uh, it, it was, of course, to a certain extent, a great idea. But when it comes to implementation, uh, setting against the original aspiration, the potential, and also measured by projects, measures by on the ground successes, I think uh, it is limited. Thank you. Uh... Asilian, you want to pose your question? Uh, okay, Asilian may be offline, but she did ask a question up, following up on Barry's. Uh, what happens when the criteria for success differ between host states or recipient states and China? Uh, I mean, that, that is precisely the, the issue with uh, many of the projects in with PRI, in, in the case of Malaysia with the ECRL, for instance, uh, what co counts as success for uh, Malaysia, the Malaysian government, even that is contested, that is heavily contested, uh, differs from the Chinese perspective. Um, well, what do you think should be the ways by which we reconcile that? Uh, and also more broadly, maybe if I, I can broaden the question, uh, how do you think we should resolve issues when, especially when the domestic politics are entangled with uh, uh, you know, the, the, the objectives and the goals of Chinese developers. I, I still come back to this point that if, um, I mean, we understand that Chinese uh, finances are important to these states. Chinese finances uh, uh, is very important to, to Southeast Asian states. So we, we, will see, we would like to see Chinese finances in our, in our states, in our regions, in our countries. We would also like to see skill transfer or technological, technology transfer. It's important that investment and finances come, come with jobs, technological transfer, and skill upgrade. Now, if this come, comes together, that means it comes as a package, uh, it is clear upgrading of the, the economy, the, the technology, that I think will, it will have long lasting impact on the ground. It is no longer just projects between the elites of a particular state with a construction company in China. I think China will have to move away from this elite driven projects, which may not necessarily be accepted by other elites in, in those societies. Uh, so when there is a change of government, there will be changes, there will surely be changes to, to these mega projects. And um, it may not necessarily be acceptable to the public in the societies, to the voting public, public in the society, which is why I say China needs to understand that this state itself has agency. They may have divided elites, they may also have a huge domestic, domestic audience, which may not necessarily be happy with China's uh, actions in South China Sea, and which may not ha be happy that some of these investments do not bring in sufficient number of local jobs. So I think it has to go, whatever investment that, ha that are sustainable has to go back to the questions of uh, sustainable finances, skill development, technological transfer, uh, and, and jobs. If we can go back to this basis, those will be long lasting investment with or without the states. Yeah, thanks, Chin Tong. In fact, that's development policy 101, right? In, in everything, every time we talk about development economics, we say, you know, for a country like Malaysia and for most of the maritime Southeast Asian countries, we are not short of investable savings. What we need is not just the money, what we need would be skills transfers, technology transfers, uh, what we call develop, economic development spillovers. And I think that's one good criteria to bear in mind when we look at these uh, benefits, this criteria for what, what counts as success. Are we seeing these uh, spillovers in economic uh, uh, development? And sec the second point you made, which I, I think is very salient, is 
you know, to the extent that BRI projects involve elite exchanges of power, privilege, profit, uh, we should be very wary uh, and we should weigh those against, you know, what are the corresponding benefits uh, in terms of economic development. I think if we keep those two criteria in mind, uh, we have a much better shot at, you know, translating the potential and opportunity that BRI represents uh, into real developmental outcomes. So on that note, uh, thank you very much, Chin Tong. Uh, uh, you, you, you know, we can go on forever. Uh, I, ho I, hope, I hope we can stay for the rest of the policy dialogues. I will, I will. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donald. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and there are also questions on the Q&A. Uh, feel free to address them if you, if you, if you think they are uh, interesting or relevant, uh, as well as on the chat. Uh, our next uh, policy dialogue is with a, policy, a keen policy observer, a keen policy commentator. Uh, he's uh, James Crabtree, a British uh, writer uh, who's based in Singapore. At the, at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, he's Associate Professor of Practice there. Uh, James has uh, worked in the British government, he's been a writer, he's written for the Financial Times, he was formerly the Financial Times correspondent in Mumbai, he's also written for a wide variety of publications including the Nikkei Asian Review where he's a regular contributor, uh, the New York Times, The Economist, Wired and Foreign Policy. Uh, James is also the uh, author of The Billionaire Raj, which was published in 2018. It was one of uh, Financial Times uh, Business Books of the Year. Uh, tells a compelling story of uh, crony capitalism, of, of, of uh, corruption, of, uh, of the, the nature of billionaire politics, right? Patronage politics is the thing that, the thing that Chin Tong and I were talking about. Uh, so James is going to speak about the, uh, uh, China's BRI in the COVID era. A pandemic setback or full steam ahead? Over to you, James. Very good. Okay, thanks, Donald. Um, thanks for having me, everyone. That was an excellent introduction. It was nice to uh, hear Chin Tong's point of view. It's nice to see so many of you joining us and um, some friends as well. I see on the participant list. I'll say hello to Philip Andrew Speed, given we ran into each other in our condo this morning. Um, I I've been following the BRI ever since I was a correspondent in India. So uh, my I. Uh, the treat I got um, on top of my India experience was I was the FT's correspondent in Sri Lanka. And so I made my first visit to the then recently opened Hambantota port in 2012. And in a sense, became fascinated by the whole narrative, not just about China's so-called string of pearls, but about China debt trap diplomacy and have followed BRI reasonably closely um, ever since, first as a journalist and then here at the League of New School. What I'd like to do is just make a couple of points. Um, as I say, I don't have any slides, so I'm going to talk reasonably briefly and leave time for a conversation about where I think BRI is heading in the post-COVID environment. I was last in Beijing just before Christmas, and at that point, in a sense, people were still grappling with what the BRI framework was going to be in the aftermath of the second forum earlier in 2019. And so there was a sort of set of discussions going on about whether the, sim the signals that had gone out during that, um, uh, that, co that second gathering were really going to amount to much, which were, could the BRI become more transparent? Could it become more multilateral? And could it become more green? In a sense, the, the BRI critics had had you know, some success in as much as during that forum, China had adopted a new language uh, to some extent. And then the question was, well, was that going to amount to anything? Really, was this, in, 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 in real reality, this bottom-up, rather chaotically organized, but still a, a very grand scale um, set of projects that didn't really have a, a central organizing authority, let alone a kind of one single strategic vision beyond the, the brand and the maps, what, was that now going to change? And, and so that was an open question. And, and so what's happened in a sense is that ran slap bang into COVID. And so I think what I want to argue today is that COVID obviously has very many ramifications for Belt and Road in the short term. Um, and I'll sketch these out. They're gonna be very familiar to all of you um, given the conference discussions. Um, but I don't think it fundamentally changes the objective of BRI in the, in the medium term, medium to long term. And, and, and in a sense, I want to sketch out what I think that is because I think that's that's important. So, so what I suppose I'm arguing is that 
COVID signals a, a new involuntary third stage of BRI. So if the, the move towards the second stage after the second forum, um, in a sense, was, was developing and people were watching how that was going to go, now we're into a, a third stage. And it's undeniable that that third stage initially is going to be much more challenging. So we all know that many of the projects have been put on hold. It's hard to see new deals emerging soon, new large scale infrastructure deals of the sort that, um, uh, that have made BRI famous. And that's partly because of the, the new caution that China uh, is going to have given its growth rates about um, lending willy nilly uh, two unsustainable projects and, and a kind of greater inward turn amongst the Chinese leadership, not least the fact that their return to stimulus domestically, um, so that insofar as China is spending money on new infrastructure, it's spending it on technology at home rather than, rather than infrastructure abroad. But it's also to do with the condition of the recipient nations that, that COVID is um, ruining the public finances of almost all emerging economies, but particularly those, many of those that have become reliant on um, certain kinds of Chinese funding, and that will make it more difficult for local elites in countries like Sri Lanka and Pakistan, which I think Donald is going to ask about in a little bit later, to come up with new plans. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that the old ones are going to be scrapped. It, it may mean that they, they will be delayed. Um, so, you know, that, that's clear. And, and I think it, it seems also clear that BRI is going to face more scrutiny if you're a country like Pakistan, for instance, and you've had to sign up to a new IMF deal in the context of COVID, there's a lot more scrutiny on whether the projects that you've signed up to um, are sensible anymore, if they, if they ever were. Um, China itself, as I said at the beginning, is going to be much more careful about the leeway that it gives to sign these deals, either the high-level bilateral deals, um, the, the really big ones, the expensive ports and railway lines, the strategic ones, but also the plethora of smaller projects that are put together by local state governments and state banks and sort of local actors in individual countries. These are also going to be more scrutinized at a moment in which time, in which money is very tight. Um, and, you know, the politics of China's whole engagement with the region um, have changed in many respects because of what's happened in COVID. So uh, as Chin Tong said, that's less true in Southeast Asia, which in a sense is still trying to kind of balance its way between the two superpowers. But, but in South Asia, the, the, because of what's happened between India and China, the politics, um, geopolitics there have become uh, more fraught in Central Asia to some degree too, in countries like Myanmar, the, 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 the pandemic has, in a sense, reinforced worries about how dependent a country like Myanmar is on, on China's economic support, but also investment in infrastructure. And, and so the politics of this has changed too. So in, in that sense, in the short term, it's quite a challenging outlook for, for BRI, although it's different on, on a country by country basis. And I think we'll, we'll dig into that in just a second. But I suppose and I suspect that what this means is that the BRI reform agenda is not going to make much progress. So, for instance, um, last year there was a lot of discussion about whether China was going to be able to sign some sort of new funding framework with multilateral institutions, particularly with AAIB, particularly with ADB. I haven't seen any progress on that. I, I think both on the recipient side and on the Chinese side, if they are going to make deals, um, they're probably going to be less concerned about things like environmental sustainability and transparency than they might have suggested they were in early 2019, um, that the pandemic environment um, is going to make it harder for China to live up to some of the commitments, um, albeit rather vague and non-specific uh, commitments that it made um, at the second BRI forum. So that, I think, is the kind of short-term context, the sort of realistic context. But in a sense, the bigger picture for China hasn't really changed. So, I, I mean, I think we probably talked a lot in this conference about the debt trap diplomacy narrative. I, I don't have a huge amount of, um, I don't find that a particularly convincing account of what China has been doing. It is undeniable, however, that, that in a sense that the, the problem of debt is going to become much more pronounced in the aftermath of COVID because the debt position of many of the recipient countries has got so much worse. 
not always in those that are most strategic. So the countries that are most indebted to China tend to be, you know, small and not very powerful. So you're talking, um, you know, Djibouti and Laos, uh, as opposed to Pakistan, that, that, that these are the ones that have the highest um, proportion of their debts to China. Um, but anyway, if you are persuaded by the debt trap diplomacy narrative, then the COVID environment is going to make that more pronounced. But I, I don't think fundamentally that's what China was doing. Um, I think in, on the one hand, China was exporting surplus capital and industrial capacity, as um, we will have discussed during this conference. But then in a sense, the long term game here is really about um, creating uh, a new set of China centric global value chains, some of which are to do with importing commodities and some of which are about the relocation of manufacturing capacity, about connecting China to a system of economic production via infrastructure, and that will change fundamentally the, the kind of economic map of the world. So you don't have a globalization that is Western centric in which you have Asia producing for advanced markets in Europe and North America and Japan. You have one that is China centric, at least um, um, in this part of Asia. And I don't think that that plan has changed um, because of COVID-19. It might be more difficult in the short term, but I think that's basically still the game here. That's what China wants to do. It wants to create better economic relations with its with its near neighbors around its own periphery and also in Africa and Latin America to create a, a kind of uh, a kind of greater economic sinosphere. And in a funny way, because of the post-COVID geopolitics, because the divisions are now sharper between Europe, India, the United States and China in the aftermath of COVID, it actually means th th that China has more of an incentive to focus on those countries, um, you know, some countries in Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Africa and Latin America that are not taking um, a much harder um, geopolitical posture towards it. And so in that sense, um, you know, BRI may have reached a phase in which there are going to be fewer blockbuster new railway lines and, and new ports um, that will attract worries of, of the, the strategic community. But the, the basic plan that, that China has, albeit somewhat kind of bottom up and arbitrarily organized, I, I think um, stays the same. Uh, and so in that sense, it's not quite full steam ahead. But the, the, in the sense, BRI remains as central an organizing principle to China's future economic development uh, as it was before. And so with that, Donald, let me pause and, and hand over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, James. Uh, I broadly agree with you that COVID is, you know, signals uh, change, obviously, uh, in terms of how projects will become a lot more disciplined. And there'll be a lot more emphasis on sustainability, on fiscal viability. Uh, but also, to some extent, uh, a great deal of continuity and, and consistency in terms of China long, China's long-term uh, objectives. Do you think, in you know, coming back to the, cha the theme of change, do you think with COVID-19, there's going to be a greater emphasis on the services aspect of, uh, of BRI? I mean, even before the pandemic, there was, you know, there was a sh somewhat of a shift from the infrastructure-heavy construction-led mega projects to what China calls the digital Silk Road. I, I know even with the digital Silk Road, the emphasis previously was very much on laying china owned fiber optic cables. Uh, but with the pandemic, you see also health services, the health Silk Road. Uh, and do you think, so, so do you think there'll be a shift away from the traditional emphasis on hardware, on infrastructure, on ports and industrial parks and railways to things which are a lot more services in nature and which potentially have the higher prospect of the sort of technology transfer skills development that Chin Tong was talking about. And if so, do you think that the outcomes for, you know, shared prosperity for, for, for economic development might look more optimistic uh, if, if, that, if that shift materializes? I, I mean, I think it's, it's a, I'm glad you mentioned that. I meant to mention it in my introduction. So I think it's undeniable that China is going to put a lot more emphasis both on the digital Silk Road and the, the, the kind of refurbished or, or um, suddenly kind of um, reborn um, a, a health Silk Road. Both of these have been small add-ons to the program that never really had much flesh on the bone. Um, and I think both of them are going to become much more prominent. And that's partly, as you say, that's a function of circumstance. If you can't, we don't want to roll out 
huge railway projects, then in a sense, you've got some space to push other things. But the post-COVID environment, particularly on health, means that China has a, a real soft power opportunity um, to not just do you know, short-term mask diplomacy and exporting of PPE, but you know, China is building a new hospital in Pakistan. It has some record in Africa of trying to help develop public health systems. I mean, these are on a reasonably small scale. So I think people who think that BRI is going to be a shadow of its former self point that you know, you're no longer talking about investments in the hundreds of billions of dollars here. The, the, I think the, the, sum, the sum total of China's health investment into Africa, which has been where it's previously both been most active, is only about six or seven billion dollars. It's not huge sums of money. So in both of these areas, I think the question is, what, what scale are we going to be talking about? And that isn't quite clear yet. Uh, the digital Silk Road has an emphasis on, um, I mean, partly on infrastructure development, sort of broadband networks, but, but partly also digital free trade zones. It'd be interesting to hear uh, Chin Tong's view on that because some of them are, are, um, are in Malaysia. Uh, both of these, I, I think it's unclear yet what the scale of China's ambitions are going to be. And on the digital side, uh, how they will be affected by the worsening um, you know, digital battle between the US and China, um, both of which in a sense could, could get in the way and make more complicated um, the, the notion of, of accepting Chinese hardware in particular. Mm. We've got a question on, thanks, Jip. We've got a question on the Q&A. Uh, you said that China would like to build uh, supply chains uh, and what you call a global network uh, 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 of, of uh, a supply chain network that is centered around China. Uh, and of course, stated boldly, that sounds alarming. Uh, but, uh, but they can also service domestic markets. They can also be the, of benefit to, to uh, uh, the recipient countries. Can you, can you provide some examples in which uh, China's BRI has helped uh, re recipient countries reach out to or, or serve a larger a global market? When I, you say it's alarming, I, I don't see it as particularly alarming. I mean, if you are a country in Southeast Asia and you, you know, you have your, you're trying to balance between China and America, um, but one of the big benefits of China is the, you know, the economic well-being that that it brings and the, the trade and development that you get out of China. And so the notion that, uh, let's say, you know, China has the notion that it wants to move up the economic value chain and perhaps move some of the industries that it previously did at home out into other countries where that's more appropriate. Um, it hasn't really quite begun to do that yet at a kind of strategic level, but I don't see that that's particularly alarming, nor do I think it should be particularly alarming in theory to the West, except in so far as it indicates, you know, the general sweep of history towards the rise of Asia in a world in which Western markets are, are less influential than they they were. I, I, it's I, at the moment this is a kind of nascent idea. I mean, it, it's undeniable that most of the net, most of the money that goes into BRI um, is still in infrastructure development and in natural resources and you know, building power stations in Pakistan and that sort of thing. So the as yet, China has not begun to shift much of its manufacturing capacity deliberately outside of China. But nonetheless, I mean, that, that's the ultimate objective. China doesn't want to be making low value material um, when it could, in a sense, have Chinese companies moving that material and doing it elsewhere and, and becoming more competitive. So, I, 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 you know, it seems entirely sensible for Chinese planners to have this as part of their, their objectives. So. Um, but yeah, I, 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 the point is well taken, but how true is that actually? I mean, uh, is it the case that China is entirely comfortable with exporting its industrial capacity and the move out of uh, lower value added uh, manufacturing? Uh, or is China actually has an interest in trying to keep uh, some of that, right? Uh, but I do, I do take the larger point that as the West you know, engages in what is now called deglobalization, right? Nearshoring, reshoring. There is certainly an opportunity both for China as well as for its the recipient countries to upgrade, right? To diversify its its industrial base, uh, and for China to export some of its industrial overcapacity. But but what's your sense that 
do, do, do China's industrial planners and, and policymakers see it in their own interest to to aggressively push out that that overcapacity and to and in a sense to export its uh, its manufacturing prowess? I think it, it's it's an option. So my understanding has always been that that some part of you know part of what you'd like to do is to move some of those industries away from the coasts and towards the Chinese interior, um, which also needs jobs and economic development, and that's probably your primary. Um, objective, but that um, also you're trying to build, um, you know, you're trying to build relationships with other countries, particularly those, you know, maybe in Africa that have particular kinds of natural resources. You also have partnership programs. So I think about some of the things that are done in Myanmar, the special economic zones, the new cities the, that have a kind of trade component. And the idea is that once you, this is very well established, this is what Singapore has done by building these trade zones, once you've had a, a hand in building them, then you hope that they will become populated by, by your own businesses, some of which will be you know, moving capabilities out of China to relocate in other countries. I agree with you. I mean, at the moment, this is nascent. You certainly can't point to as many examples of these as you can point to railway lines and ports and, uh, and power stations. But, but nonetheless, I think this is, this is part of the plan for the, the medium to long term. Uh, Barry, you uh, go ahead, Barry. I see you have a question here. Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, the non-infrastructure aspects of the BRI uh, in relationship to uh, the events of this year, and particularly COVID-19, because the, the data from the first half of 2020 uh, seems to indicate that there hasn't been any let off with regard to uh, Chinese investment going out in manufacturing and natural resources, et cetera. Well, what you've said about infrastructure certainly is uh, generally correct. Um, it, it does seem like these other aspects um, have not been well, they haven't taken a tremendous hit in terms of Chinese activity uh, in the BRI developing countries, at least. And I was wondering whether you thought that this was just something which is a kind of uh, leftover from uh, the time that you spoke about initially in 2019, uh, before, the B before the COVID-19 pandemic began, or whether this is something that we can expect to be more sustained. I, mean, I suspect it's a little bit of both. I also suspect the play here is the fact that the sums of money involved in those areas are smaller than they are in the mega infrastructure projects. And so that, that when you're thinking about, you know, what you need to, if you really want to decide you want to save some money or you are worried about the sustainability of some of your previous investments, then the big ticket infrastructure projects um, are, are an easier thing to, to slow down because they're often less sustainable in the first place. But it's interesting, if you look at something like Pakistan, so um, CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, as everyone on here will know, is um, arguably the largest uh, of the BRI projects, sort of $60, $70 billion, also one of the most strategically important given the India-China conflict. And, and, and you know, a lot of people, not just prior to COVID, but especially when COVID happened, we're reading the death rights of the CPEC program, um, partly on the Pakistan side, um, because Pakistan had entered a new IMF program and the thought was, well, they're not going to be able to go ahead with all of these, you know, slightly sketchily um, financed programs, but also on the Chinese side that there was a sense, even before COVID, that Chinese elites had got a bit fed up. Um, overfunding um, some of these projects that may not get um, paid back. But actually, in the aftermath of COVID, as far as I can see, you know, CPEC is moving along reasonably briskly. So last week, there was a deal signed $7 billion for the railway line that they're refurbishing that goes from Karachi through Lahore and then eventually up to, to Kashmir. Um, there was another uh, set of hydro projects that were opened up in Jammu and Kashmir. Um, and in a sense, it's been quite interesting to watch because it appears that the Pakistani army has taken much greater ownership over the, these sets of projects. So it doesn't look from that example that, you know, some, some of these projects have been delayed for short term reasons, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all going to get cancelled. It might just mean that they're, you know, that they're moving along slightly more slowly than they, they would have done before, and maybe with somewhat more scrutiny, maybe slightly scaled down, 
um, you know, some of the more expensive add-ons are removed. But but it doesn't even seem to me that that all of the big infrastructure projects are, are even being that badly affected either. Uh, and you can sort of look at that in Sri Lanka as well. The, the port city, the Colombo port, a lot of the iconic projects, you know, they have been delayed. They've, they've slowed down, but especially given the nature of the new government in Sri Lanka, who are, you know, more China friendly than the previous government. Again, I would imagine that they will move ahead, albeit perhaps, you know, slightly smaller and slightly slower than they were doing before. Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, proposition, right? That COVID-19 might turn out to be a blessing in disguise for this large-scale construction infrastructure project in the sense that it instills a greater, or it brings about greater scrutiny, instills greater financial discipline. It might catalyze a scaling down or, or slowing down of these uh, mega projects. And maybe that's needed. That's exactly what's needed. Uh, yeah, and I think that it's an, it's an interesting point. I mean, I think the jury is out on whether that is actually what is happening. And certainly, so there's clearly going to be a greater focus on financial stability from the Chi financial sustainability from the Chinese side. Whether that amounts to a, a kind of a, what was being promised at the last BRI forum, which wasn't, which was financial sustainability from the debtor nation side as well as environmental sustainability and greater transparency and potentially also multilateralism, I, I have my doubts. I mean, I, I sort of feel that that in a much harder environment, then these things will turn out to be kind of nice add-ons that the Chinese had signed up to to slightly placate their critics, both um, in the kind of international um, multilateral bodies, but also in their recipient countries who had you know, seen some truth in the, the kind of debt trap um, narrative. But in tough times, I wonder if, if those are going to be, you know, that those, those are less likely to be added. But yes, I mean, I, I think it's likely that, that some of these big projects, they'll take a look at the, the sustainability of the projects. And, you know, that has actually been true before COVID as well. If you look in Myanmar, uh, the, the Burmese government complained about the, the, the port at Chao Phu on, on the Indian Ocean coast. Uh, which had originally been scoped at, and I forget the figures, something like $10 billion. And the Burmese government said, well, this is ridiculous. We agreed to this, but it's far too big. And China, you know, scaled it back down to a couple of billion dollars. And, and so China has been, to give China its due, has been, you know, reasonably flexible about, as long as the big landmark projects go ahead, it has been reasonably flexible about renegotiating the terms and certainly will have to be flexible about debt. I mean, as I said before, if you're worried about debt trap diplomacy, um, uh, then now is your time really to be worried because the debt position of so many of these emerging markets is going to get substantially worse over the next couple of years and their ability to repay the loans that they've taken from China, whether those are commercial loans or concessionary loans of some sort or another is going to be less. And I, I, I don't know if coming out of this conference, you've got a sense of what people think about how China is approaching this task that of, of, in a sense, managing debt forgiveness and how how quickly and how generously it's moving. And I think that's another really interesting question to watch where I haven't yet got a good sense of how China is going to manage this, um, uh, both in terms of the, 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 the kind of cheap bilaterally agreed loans, but also the, the expensive commercial loans that its banks have given as well and how it's going to balance the need to keep its state-owned banks and state companies solvent in a in a very difficult economic position at home with the need not to be seen as a predatory lender abroad. Yeah, I always thought, I mean, I agree with what you said at the outset, that this whole argument about debt trap diplomacy is often overstated and in some instances just downright incorrect. Uh, as Keynes, John Maynard Keynes said more than a century ago, if you owe the bank a hundred pounds, you have a problem, but if you owe the bank a million pounds, the bank has a problem. China is in this case the banker, right? So it's, it has got every interest to be flexible about debt forgiveness, there's every reason to exercise due diligence, to, to scrutinize these, uh, especially, uh, these, these, these debt arrangements, uh, these credit arrangements. So, so the idea that the debt trap diplomacy reflects deliberate intent or it's part of you know, the, the, the uh, uh, strategy of China seems to me far-fetched. Uh, so yeah. I think we are almost uh, uh, out of time. I, I do have one last question on on, on Sino-India relations. Now, India is not part of the BRI. It's not a signatory to the BRI, but obviously it's watching all these developments with great concern. 
And so how has BRI uh, and, and, and BRI post-COVID, in the COVID era, how has that affected uh, Sino-India relations? Has it been, uh, uh, I, I imagine it's just accentuated and, and heightened suspicion across Sino-India, uh, for Sino-India time? Yeah, I mean, I, I think almost the most significant geopolitical change to come out of the COVID moment will be the, the, the fissure between China and India. I mean, it, it, America under Trump is already staunchly anti-Chinese. The Europeans in a kind of one step forward, one step back way, we're also moving in that direction. Uh, but it's really India where the change has been most dramatic, um, not, both because of COVID, but obviously because of what happened in the, the Himalayas. Uh, and the change in thinking amongst the Indian strategic community, the, the the elite has been quite profound and I think is not going to go back to the sort of status quo ante of, of trying to not quite balance, but but to at least have better relations with, with China. And so, I mean, India was already very skeptical about BRI, didn't, it didn't attend the first or the second forum. It's very worried about um, about CMEC, it's worried about Sri Lanka, it's worried about Myanmar. I don't think any of that changes. It's not quite clear whether what will happen is that India will, with its limited resources, particularly post-COVID, will be able, therefore, to, to kind of get its act together and, and become more of an alternative or to be a more willing participant in other alternatives, for instance, working together with the Japanese, the Americans, the Australians, and other China skeptic powers. Sri Lanka is a good test case of this at the moment. So now the Rajapaksas have come back. The Rajapaksas have said in Sri Lanka, the, the new government, um, Kotabia and Mahinda are now back in power. And they've said that Sri Lanka will follow an, a quote, India first foreign policy, namely recognizing that, you know, India is the giant in the backyard and they want to have good relations with India. But there's a sense in Sri Lanka that, that what tends to happen is that Sri Lanka says, well, we need some money to do this. And they ask India first. And then India says, well, actually, we don't have any money and we can't help. And then Sri Lanka goes to China anyway. So it's going to be interesting to see whether the more kind of hawkish, assertive, uh, anti-Chinese um, language coming out of New Delhi actually results in any policy changes that will provide recipient countries in South Asia and near to South Asia with alternatives to, to Chinese money. I and mean, that I think is again, what's, that's what's interesting to watch now, not clear at this stage um, how that will play out. Mm, fantastic. Thanks very much, James, uh, for those, as usual, wonderful insights. Uh, I hope you can hang around for the rest of uh, the session, just half an hour more. It, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our last, of, uh, the, the, our last speaker, but certainly not least, uh, for the policy dialogues. Uh, he's, uh, Karat Kalambitov, the governor of the Astana International Financial Center, or AIFC in short. It's a huge initiative, a major initiative uh, by the Kazakhstan government to uh, develop the country's uh, non-bank uh, financial center. Just a word uh, on, on Karat. He's an extremely accomplished uh, policymaker. He previously served as the central bank governor uh, of Kazakhstan from 2013 to 2015. He was also previously the vice president uh, Prime Minister of Kazakhstan from 2012 to 2013. And he has also served as the CEO of uh, Kazakhstan's uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, Samruk Kazin. So he's got a great deal of ex experience and expertise in, in all finance related and financial policy making matters in, in Kazakhstan. Uh, so welcome to, to, to this conference, Karen, and, and over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Donald for inviting me to this uh, conference and it's, uh, it's a great pleasure actually to participate in, in the discussion. So uh, I think that uh, I'm, I have a some slightly more positive uh, view on uh, development of the Belt and Road Initiative. So you know that we, this initiative uh, first of all been uh, announced the first uh, time uh, by President Xi during his uh, visit to Kazakhstan. And uh, for us, it's a natural continuation of the, our uh, old uh, ancient tradition in terms of the trade routes, which is connecting uh, Asia and Europe. So let me uh, also stop on, on the special role of the uh, financial centers. I am governing now uh, International Financial Center in the city of Nur Sultan. So it will be uh, logically, if I will, from the uh, AAC angle point of view, will uh, explain how do we see in Kazakhstan or even in broader terms in Central Asia, the development of uh, Belt and Road uh, Initiative. 
So we know that uh, nowadays in a, in, a post, in a COVID time or even in a post-COVID time, there are some uh, particular questions so how these initiatives has to be developed. But uh, to my mind, there are a few, a few uh, ways uh, uh, how we can communicate to each other in terms of this initiative. So first of all, I would like to focus on uh, a kind of general view. What is the uh, uh, Belt and Road uh, Initiative's, uh, uh, let's say, background? What was the context for Central Asia? Let's say, I know that there are uh, maybe other issues in, in other countries, but in Central Asia, again, it was uh, natural restoring the ancient Silk Road. If you remember, uh, in the uh, uh, mid Middle Ages, the Central Asia plays a significant role connecting China those time with uh, Western Europe uh, and also with, uh, with Iran of those time, Persia. It was like uh, key uh, trade routes. And uh, so those time, the global financial centers been located also in Central Asia. So it was like a very uh, interesting role of Central Asia. And uh, we've been proud that... Uh, uh, the first time this initiative, uh, which we kind of uh, reading like uh, restoring the land bridge of uh, which is connecting Asia and Europe, the first time announced in Kazakhstan, like uh, I already mentioned, the presidency in his uh, first visit to Kazakhstan uh, in his lecture in Nazarbayev University, which is one of the leading universities uh, in Central Asia, announced uh, the new strategy for global cooperation. So we uh, are reading the Belt and Road Initiative like initiative of uh, uh, connectivity. So at the beginning, it was more infrastructure connectivity. And I think that uh, here we, we have to focus on, on the numbers, let's say. We've seen that it's a lack of the in, uh, investment to infrastructure uh, within the Asia continent. So, uh, so previously, all the multinational institutions not covered this uh, not cover it with deficit. So uh, countries, uh, the demography is increasing. So according to the McKinsey uh, research, the uh, economic gravity of the world is now moving back uh, through the centuries to, to Asia. So Southeast Asia uh, demography uh, is, uh, is very promising. So it means that uh, this region needs uh, better connectivity, which is again, transport routes, uh, aviation, railways, highways. And I think in this terms, the, this lack of uh, in, infrastructure is, uh, is uh, one of the key points of this initiative. So we start, I think, from the transport infrastructure or energy infrastructure. And uh, I do believe that uh, the Central Asia also will play a significant role in terms of the, um, uh, let's say, restoring this uh, lack of infrastructure. You see the big number, so it's like over one uh, trillion dollars investment should be done, uh, let's say, in, uh, in the next uh, years. And the, it's some, uh, and the role of uh, uh, Central Asia is, is not, uh, looks like very significant, but it's in terms of the percentage of population, and we have 55 million people are uh, located in Central Asia, uh, but we do have very promising uh, demographies that uh, in 20 years it will be uh, close to the 100 million people. So that's why it's very important for us to uh, be in the landlocked uh, region to really to be connected through the different dimensions. And for us, it's like a very natural uh, advantages to be part of, uh, of this initiative. And definitely there is a huge impact on global GDP, according to the World Bank is around uh, 3 percentage. So I think that, uh, so one of the views that the Belt and Road maybe uh, in the post-COVID time would be one of the key driver of the economic growth uh, in, uh, in frontier markets or in emerging markets, uh, in, including the Central Asia countries. And uh, let me stop also for particularly Kazakhstan uh, roles on uh, Belt and Road Initiative, maybe some uh, short background, geographic background. So the Kazakhstan has a, is a country uh, neighboring with, uh, with China. So we located in, in Central Asia. So we have a, a territory like uh, entire Western uh, European territory. So it's a huge territory. We are no, number nine in the world. And you see that we have a uh, like a connection with a different markets. So from one side, we have the biggest border with Russia more than 7,000 kilometers, which is a bigger than US and Canadian uh, border. 
So we have a more than 2,000 kilometers border with China on, on the east of part of Kazakhstan. And we have a neighborhood on Caspian Sea and access to, to other Central Asia countries. So, uh, and you can see that two out of the six uh, uh, BRI uh, routes, uh, actually, and two major uh, land routes are going through territory of Kazakhstan. So what was done, I think that uh, we can say even we started this initiative even earlier than it was announced, frankly say. So in 2010, we started together with China actually built uh, very good uh, trade facilities in our border. I'm talking about Korgos uh, dry port and uh, Dostik dry port. And these uh, two uh, points we connected in a different uh, dimension. So you see that we can uh, connect it by the a highway uh, which is uh, Western Europe and Western uh, connected Western Europe and Western China through Kazakhstan and Russia. Uh, actually, we also we use our budget means and uh, also use the uh, the loan from the World Bank. Also, we connected it from the center of Kazakhstan to the seaport Aktau on the Caspian Sea, which is one of the leading port facilities now. And we also built, built the railway which is connected uh, us to the uh, GCC region through Turkmenistan and Iran. So it's like very diversified routes, but the entire idea is actually served to the, uh, re, uh, let's say, recreation of the land bridge between uh, European, uh, Eastern European, Western European markets and Western, part, part, uh, and Western part of China. So historically, we know that after the Silk Road lost the, the historical role to connect by trade because it was a maritime, also those time maritime routes. And now that the maritime routes is now about 97% maybe of the global trade. So I think even the small uh, percentages, it will be in absolute terms, big numbers for to recreate this uh, physical trade. And uh, uh, so uh, in terms of the particular numbers, I already mentioned that the Kazakhstan uh, invest uh, starting uh, from 2010 till um, actually last decade, so something like uh, $54 billion. Uh, so if you remember, we, we started uh, even earlier uh, to build all the oil pipelines, uh, also the gas pipeline through Turkmenistan, the biggest pipeline in the world uh, is actually connected uh, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and, and China. Uh, we also start to build uh, the highways, dry ports. Uh, um, we start to modernize our uh, airports. And this is all uh, actually uh, part of not just like a national policy, it was like united policy of all countries in the region, uh, in Central Asia, in Caucasus countries. So we've also been connected through Caspian Sea to through Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, uh, um, uh, to Eastern European markets. So the, uh, the recent numbers that uh, for the next uh, five years, we, we do have a like analogy of this uh, Belt and Road program in uh, in the national uh, terms, we call it or uh, which is, uh, and we, uh, we ha have a kind of optimistic plan to invest by our own means around uh, 13, billion, uh, 13 billion dollars. But if you can see that uh, in uh, 2014, 2019, According to the American Enterprise Institute, it will also been invested 13 billion, not just uh, in a transport, but also in a, some industrial project and energy project as well. So uh, back to my key point is that uh, uh, during the uh, uh, during the uh, uh, let's say uh, the history of the ancient Silk Road, the financial hubs or cities play uh, own significant role. So it was like very important to bring security to the, to the trade. And those times cities was like a trade hubs. And I think the financial centers nowadays also play the same role uh, in terms of the investment facilitation, uh, trade promotion, and kind of uh, focusing on uh, connectivity and new, uh, new technologies as well, like a FinTech, uh, like e-commerce. And, and in this terms, financial centers, uh, uh, to my mind, are playing a significant role. Let's talk about the Hong Kong are playing like a role like a gate to the north uh, uh, to China, uh, uh, global gate to China. Also, we recently, uh, like 15 years ago, created Dubai International Financial Center is an important uh, gateway to the Middle East and Northern Africa region. Casablanca uh, city is a 
gateway to entire Africa. In this terms, I think there was a missing point was uh, uh, the uh, gateway uh, to also to Central Asia, or in broader terms, even post-Soviet Union, like a Eurasian Economic Union, which is a big market, like around 250 million people. And uh, it was a special initiative to create uh, Astana International Financial Center, like a regional hub for Central Asia, including the, the Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, AFC was launched like a part of the uh, structural reforms in Kazakhstan. So you know, the Kazakhstan is a very important uh, energy producer. So we produce 1.8 million barrel per day. We're gonna double it in the next uh, two decades. And in this terms, for the key challenge for the Kazakhstan economy is the diversification of the economy, to creation of non-oil subsectors of the economy. So because we now even kind of uh, um, uh, start to meet uh, this uh, combination of two storms. So one storm is a pandemic and the second storm is a drop of the energy uh, prices. But it, it is not first time for Kazakhstan. So the first crisis, uh, we, we remember it was 1998 uh, crisis, uh, global financial crisis in 2008 and energy crisis in 2000, prices, uh, crisis in 2014 and 15. The response to this crisis was to create a kind of third generation of the development uh, institutions. So one of these uh, um, reforms, uh, five, uh, among uh, five institutional reform uh, was focused on rule of law. And rule of law is an important part of the legal reform in Kazakhstan. And uh, part of this reform is establishment first time and uh, uh, the only yet is uh, rules and standards of the English common law jurisdictions. So in this terms, it was a special amendment to the constitutions. Uh, in 2017, which is allow us, uh, according to these amendments, to create special legal and regulatory regime in financial area in the city of Nur Sultan. Very much similar, which was done in previous decades in, in Qatar, in, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi global markets authorities. So actually, we uh, provided the standards uh, uh, benefits for the, for the participants. It's like a tax benefit, special uh, currency regime, uh, world-class uh, trading and finance uh, platform. and But the most important is the dispute uh, resolution authorities, which is based on common law. It's a court of AFC and also international arbitration center. And just to let you know that in the court of AFC, we have a dream team of retired British judges. The first uh, chief justice of our court was a legendary Lord Wolf. Now Lord Mans is a... Um, uh, his successor. So the idea is, is really to create the institutions which would be trustable for the global investors community. And uh, at the same time, we also create the independent financial regulations, more based uh, for benchmark for us was like uh, monetary authorities of Singapore or financial conducting authorities in London. Uh, so from one side, it's a super, uh, very prudent supervision. And from the other side is uh, uh, focusing on uh, uh, on a business friendly and tech friendly uh, tech friendly uh, um, climb. Uh, so we have a special uh, we have a structure where the management council is leading by the president of, uh, of Kazakhstan. So President Tokayev recently adopted the, uh, with the members of the management council the new strategy till 2025, which is focusing on the goal to create a regional financial center uh, in Central Asia. So you see that all the, uh, the, the uh, let's say, institutions, which I already mentioned. And uh, what is, is the role of, uh, how do we see the role particular of AFC is really uh, to create opportunities and access to, uh, to funding for the uh, regional uh, companies and local companies in order to um, let's say, to develop the different aspects of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So we create, uh, the, first of all, the new platform on, on, of capital markets. And it's uh, also a very unique combination. So we do have a stakeholders or shareholders of our stock exchange. From one side, uh, we have a NASDAQ and we're empowered by the NASDAQ technologies and, and also Goldman Sachs International is a participant. And all from the other side, it's the Shanghai Stock Exchange and Silk Road Fund. And actually, which is important that 25% of our platform belongs to Shanghai Stock Exchange and 5% to Silk Road Fund. So the idea was to uh, bring uh, uh, leading uh, Chinese financial institutions uh, with the idea to really connect our markets to Chinese uh, financial markets. So the uh, in uh, 
And this platform become a key platform for the um, restoring the capital markets in Central Asia and also for pri huge privatization processes in Kazakhstan. Uh, recently, the uh, Kazakhstan from uh, global uranium company been uh, duly listed uh, in, in AFC and uh, in London. It was very successful IPO and uh, later on as SPO of this company. And even with even the COVID time in March, it was the second uh, secondary listing. It was very successful. We also specifically created the Belt and Road market, which is uh, focusing uh, uh, to create a special segment for the BRI and regional projects. And the good news was um, in March, the first uh, time uh, also was listed on Falcon, Falcon Bonds, which is a Chinese construction bank, one, one of the leading Chinese uh, bank actually, issued uh, the first uh, bonds denominated in uh, Chinese currency. It was uh, around 1 billion uh, renminbi. And for us, it was like a pioneering, very good uh, message and signal that it was it was very successful uh, listing. And I think that this is also one of the idea so that the AAC can play a significant role like a uh, 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 like, like hub for the uh, for trade in uh, Chinese currencies. So we try to create also the offshore uh, clearing center determinated uh, in RMB, which is uh, uh, also, we are not unique. We're just following the examples which was done in Singapore and uh, in, 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 uh, in Dubai. We're in a close touch with uh, Hong Kong since very beginning. So we, we have a, a thanks go, we have a direct flight. So we have a good cooperation with the Hong Kong authorities. So we, we are in a good cooperation with the government, uh, with the University of Hong Kong. We're also focusing on to develop the human capital in, in Central Asia, in Kazakhstan. And we focus on the particularly FinTech and asset management uh, programs. Uh, we are partnering with Rappel Partners Asset Management Company also with the idea to build new generation of the asset managers in uh, in order to manage wealth of the, our region. And also our arbitration center in good touch with the Hong Kong Arbitration Center uh, of the China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission and also Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. So the idea is actually to also to build very familiar environment here for the uh, let's say global investors for Chinese investors uh, to walk also in our part of the world uh, through these uh, let's say familiar mechanisms. So what what is the current uh, challenges? I already mentioned that uh, so probably the, the key crisis in terms of the uh, uh, post pandemic and uh, with even the pandemic is uh, access to the liquidity. So and I, I think in this term, so we have to be to build, let's say, sustainable macroeconomic policy, sustainable fiscal policy. Again, we maybe we have exclusive example in Kazakhstan that we, we don't have any situation with over debt. The entire government debt is less than 8% of GDP in Kazakhstan. And we don't have really significant uh, um, exposure of the Chinese financial institutions. So I think that we're trying to diversify different access to the different, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, source of, of liquidity. But I think that uh, having this in mind to creation the right uh, access and uh, opportunities, for example, for dual listing in, in Nur Sultan in Ho and Hong Kong or dual listing in Nur Sultan or Shanghai is also really good news for us. I think that we also have a not yet really uh, uh, full exp uh, exposure of uh, the many institutions which was uh, been specifically created for Belt and Road Initiative, such as, uh, for example, uh, Silk Road Fund, which was been created by People's Bank of China, or Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or also AAB, has to play a more significant role in Central Asia. I think that the other opportunities, we just not focus on the first generation of physical infrastructure, but also has to be focused for the, uh, let's say, for the new technologies. And I think China is a great example and benchmark uh, how in a, a very uh, a short period of time, they actually achieved uh, great results in terms of the uh, uh, financial uh, inclusion of the population and access through the new fintech facilities, big data, AI, uh, to the new, uh, let's say, new particular tools. And I think that the, now China is the leading among the, uh, all countries in the world in terms of the 
with uh, financial in, in, um, inclusivity issues. The other aspects, I think, in the COVID time is also the uh, good experience of uh, response to the epidemiological, uh, uh, let's say, uh, challenge. And I think here is a telemedicine and uh, biotechnology is also an area for the uh, for the future uh, cooperation, uh, for the future cooperation. So let me stop here. I think that you have uh, some uh, particular questions, and uh, I'm ready to respond. Thanks very much, uh, Kairat. Uh, as usual, it's an extremely insightful uh, presentation on on Kazakhstan's economic development challenges. And, and and for the benefit of the audience who may be hearing about Kazakhstan for the first time, I think Kazakhstan is one of those. Uh, landlocked countries in, in Central Asia, which faces a particularly challenging uh, economic development prospect. I think it is, as Kairat mentioned, it is landlocked. Uh, there's uh, over-reliance on uh, oil and natural resources. And it's also got a legacy of uh, Soviet central planning, uh, which is tr trying to address through you know, governmental reforms, through privatization. And in many ways, I think... Uh, the BRI represents a platform, an opportunity for Kazakhstan to pursue, uh, to complement its uh, economic reform efforts. Uh, you talked about the dry ports, which, you know, and, and also the, 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 land, the land links, the, the railway as well as road links uh, to, to Europe and to China as a way of overcoming your landlocked uh, impediment, your landlocked obstacles. Uh, likewise, the AIFC is really a very powerful institution to mobilize capital, mobilize savings, no, uh, use, make use of uh, various financial instruments to mobilize and direct capital to Kazakhstan's economic diversification uh, and privatization efforts. So I think, you know, many things going on in, in this um, emerging economy that, uh, that is Kazakhstan uh, and many exciting things in the in the fields of digitalization, in the fields of uh, creating new trade routes uh, over land. So this, this, in many ways, Kazakhstan em is emblematic of uh, China's overland uh, belt initiative. Uh, I see that there's some questions on, on, on the chat. So maybe I'll invite uh, Angela, uh, who's been working mostly on Maritime Southeast Asia, uh, to, to, to ask a question. Uh, Angela, go ahead. Thank you, Donald, and uh, thank you, Mr. Klimetov, for a very great presentation. Um, I, I was interested in knowing more about um, the digital financial services in Kazakhstan uh, provided by uh, AIFC, and also um, if there are any Chinese investments in fintech, and uh, also about the regulatory sandbox. I wanted to understand more about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this question. I think uh, from very beginning, uh, we just realized when we start uh, and we started build the new financial center in 2015. So since those time, we realized that uh, we cannot like uh, um, build something like uh, old uh, generation financial centers and we cannot repeat uh, the advantages of the 90, 80s and 90s like in New York and London or in years uh, 2000s in Dubai. So what is the key uh, features of the, uh, let's say, modern or even future financial centers, I think is, uh, should be the digital financial centers. So this is, we see that this digital revolution uh, in the financial industry, it's like a part of the fourth industrial revolution, like a part of the access to the new technologies like AI and FinTech. And FinTech is uh, really uh, like a disruptive. I mean, like FinTech and Big Tech, uh, let's say both dimensions of the new technologies and uh, which is uh, definitely will change the uh, landscape of the uh, financial industry. So in these terms, uh, we have to build the special uh, regulation, uh, let's say climate, which is really friendly. And we learn from the monetary authorities of Singapore and conducting authorities in London that we have to build a sp special regime for this. And one of the uh, solutions is to create special uh, sandbox which is uh, it's a plat regulation platform which is allowed to test new technologies. So new technologies can bring the, also the particular risks. And for regulation authorities, it's uh, also very important to, let's say, to, uh, to learn what, what is the risk and how to, we can mitigate this risk. And so we are providing opportunities for young, talented uh, people and young companies 
um, uh, startups uh, to test the technologies within six to 12 months. Uh, we're, we're kind of getting access to the, to the data and at the same time, we're checking the technologies and afterwards we can get the uh, principal uh, license, which is, I think, also good news to be recognized by the regulation authorities. We are part of also the GFIN initiatives. It's a global financial uh, initiative network uh, together with the global regulations community. It also allows us uh, to provide access to our young startups to the different uh, places, like uh, uh, open API mechanisms in Singapore or in London, also to test their technologies and also to provide the new products to, uh, to the, uh, let's say, to the market. And I think this is very promising for Kazakhstan. Uh, also, there is a good opportunities in distinction with European countries, for example. It wasn't uh, really kind of heavily decades or 100 years of investment to the uh, physical infrastructure. And now we can really leapfrog to the new technologies, like in many cases was happened in China or in Impesa in Eastern uh, Africa. So these are all uh, kind of uh, fascinating uh, uh, and a good aspiration for us to really to bring new technologies from scratch. And we, uh, like Astana International Financial Center, particularly platform for the government of Kazakhstan to focus on, on this uh, digital uh, revolution, let's say. Mm. Uh, Tara, you mentioned briefly the, 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 two, the two dry ports. Uh, am I right to say that, that these are more than ports, that there are, also, there are also cities growing around it and there's going to be industrial production capacity around Korgos, for instance? Uh, would I be right to assume that? Yeah, I think uh, uh, what is important is that in increasing the volume of trades between uh, China and between uh, uh, between Europe in broader terms, but in particular terms like as uh, western part of China or, or the, uh, the cities uh, like Chunxin, for example, are sometimes uh, focusing on, on trade, land bridge uh, train uh, to, uh, with access to the uh, eastern Europe. So, you know, there is a special agreement 16 plus plus one, which is some part of Europe is quite friendly to the uh, cooperation with China. And I think in this terms, being in the middle of this trade is also good opportunity. So first of all, is a transit role, but at the same time, the Kazakhstan wants to play more <coughs> industrial role uh, uh, in these terms. And I think that this uh, cooperation between uh, China industrial authorities and Kazakhstan industrial authorities is also very much promising. So I think two are very uh, important uh, uh, let's say, dimensions of our cooperation. So one is uh, commodities. So in this terms, you mentioned that we are oil-rich country, but not only. We are my, like a more early stage of Australia and Canada. So we have very vast uh, geography and very huge uh, range of the uh, particularly uh, mining uh, uh, productions. And all of these productions like aluminum, uh, copper, um, uh, chrome, we are all uh, also, or uranium, we are all exporting to China. So the access to the Chinese market is very strategic um, point for Kazakhstan. The second is also because of vast geography, we have good opportunities uh, to relaunch the agriculture sector and food processing. I think the uh, COVID also <clears throat> um, brought the issues of uh, food security globally, and uh, particularly Kazakhstan has a good access and good understanding of the Chinese authorities, and access to the Chinese market is very promising in terms of the food processing. And I think that we will continue to play significant role on this. And these are kind of two uh, key drivers for the further development of the Kazakhstani economy, and particularly trade centers like uh, Korgos, will play a significant role to connect uh, two markets. Yeah, Kara, we're almost out of time, but I, I would just like to ask a quick quick question on how much of this Korgos, for instance, as well as uh, the infrastructure, the, 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 the road and rail links, how much of these were already organically planned by the Kazakh government? And with Chinese financing, you know, just at being a complement and a catalyst. And how much of this was driven from, from China. My sense is it was many of these were already in the, on, the, on the drawing boards and China, Chinese financing was the icing on the cake, was, was, a, was, was a spur 
would I be right to assume that also? No, I think uh, so. Here is uh, like being uh, frank and uh, and honest. Uh, I think that we started this uh, idea of connectivity even earlier than the Chinese government proposed it in, in the year 2013. So, like I mentioned, we started it in 2005 and 2006. So it was a different puzzle. So this. <clears throat> Uh, trade and uh, uh, transport connectivity in Kazakhstan. So remember, Kazakhstan is a post-Soviet Union uh, country in the vast geography. And in Soviet Union, all roads those time led to Moscow. So it means it was very developed uh, transport routes from the south of Kazakhstan to the north of Kazakhstan and through north to the uh, Eastern European markets. But now, I think it was lack of the transportation which is connecting western part of Kazakhstan and eastern part of Kazakhstan, which is, uh, by, by the way, by, uh, by, the, uh, uh, by flight is uh, around uh, four hours, let's say. So it means that we start to, con uh, to build this network of railways, highways, uh, modernization of our airports, and it started from 2005 six, and also uh, dramatically increased uh, starting from 2010. And also we agreed those time with our Caspian neighborhood, Azerbaijan and Georgia and Turkey, that it should be special, we, we should prepare it with, let's say, these routes, what we should not uh, have a, any kind of uh, inter-border problems. So in this term, so it was like a parallel development of the Belt and, Belt and Road Initiative from one side, which is uh, with China probably will start to build railroads towards the border with Kazakhstan. And uh, just to remind you, in Soviet Union time, it was a bottleneck. So it was like a military close border. So that's why we, uh, let's say, trying to open uh, this bottleneck and trying to, that's a very natural uh, initiative for us. And we consider it is even from the historical and cultural context, uh, very natural. And uh, having in mind that we have to have a resilient uh, macroeconomic uh, policy and we have to diversify our, uh, let's say, um, different uh, resources for the development. So we, uh, I think that we, we are trying to, to make this uh, Silk Road sustainable. And mm -hmm. actually, the, just to uh, having like a, my favorite joke about uh, how do we see the, the Silk Road is like we, we're trying, entire Central Asia, trying to make Silk Road great again. I think it's natural for all of us. Uh, talking of making the Silk Road great again, one of the most significant challenges that Kazakhstan faces, and this is also a question from uh, 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 a member of the audience, is trying to balance the foreign policy imperatives and the pressures, uh, not just of China and Russia, but also of the United States. So you know, it's really a triple balancing act you, you, you are grappling with. How, how challenging has this been uh, since Kazakhstan's independence? Yeah, I think, uh, so we have a, uh, let's say, multi-vectoral uh, foreign policy. And I think the Kazakhstan is very successful in terms. So this is started from uh, the <coughs> first initiatives of the first president of Kazakhstan, uh, Nursultan Nazarbayev, actually. So we are supporting all the regional initiatives. We are part of Eurasian Economic Union together with Russia, Belarus, uh, Kyrgyzstan and Armenia. We are part of the Shanghai Co Cooperation Organization. So from very beginning, we support the Belt and Road Initiative. And from the other side, we are a strategic partner for United States uh, in Central Asia. And if you uh, consider it the uh, st uh, structure of the global trade of Kazakhstan, so the 50% of our trade is European Union, 20% Russia and 20% China. This is, uh, I think that, uh, and also we have a uh, diversify routes for the oil pipelines, for the gas pipelines, we have diversified trade routes. So the entire idea to is really to be this, uh, the buckle of this belt and uh, being the buckle, you have to be sustainable and you have to, let's say, to, uh, to, have a, to be in a good relationship with all uh, global superpowers and, and regional powers as well. That's a fantastic point to end on, Kyra, because it brings us back, brings us back to what Chin Tong starting, started talking about, which is having agency and autonomy in, uh, in setting uh, your own foreign policy and trade uh, agendas.